Hallelujah. Amen. I greet you all in the wonderful name of my Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. I'll be reading the book of Luke chapter 5 from verse 17 to 24. Hallelujah. Amen. It reads as follows. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal, to heal them. Then behold, men brought in a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they were sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst of before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Verse 21. And the, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins? But God alone. Verse 22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? 23. Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? Verse 24. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the, to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Thank you. church building and they were very intimidating brothers and they kept the church in order 
And uh, we as children were terrified to do anything in the church building because of those four brothers. I can still see their faces. Uh, maybe as Hilltop we need some intimidating brothers to start serving as, uh, as ushers. Amen. But going back to my question, why are we here? What's the role that we're supposed to play for one another? Is it just to come here every Sunday, hear some words, sing some songs, and go home? Or is there something deeper? How many of us remember what the theme for Hilltop this year is? Brother Chris, I know you do, but anybody else, maybe by a show of hands, Brother Eddie, Brother Baxter, anybody who's not an employee of Hilltop, I see Brother Tabo as well. Anybody who's not an employee of Hilltop know what our theme is? My sister, okay, you're confident, thank you for your honesty. Anybody else? Okay, two sisters. Yeah, my Jeff, you're just looking down, hey? <laughs> Alright, my brother, please put up what our theme is for 2023. It says, spurring one another on to greater levels of love for each other and motivating one another to accomplishing good works. Amen. Amen. Maybe we need to put this on the screen more often, amen? amen. This theme was particularly thought out with the purpose of gathering here every Sunday in mind. This theme is our purpose, right? Maybe I'd ask you to look around at your neighbors. Do we show one another greater levels of love? Are we motivating each other to these good works and acts of service? Look around. Look, look at your neighbor. Don't look side to side. Some of you are married. Look maybe behind you. Are we, are we doing that? Are we living up to our theme? I don't know. I'd argue this morning, church, that there's probably some improvements that we can do here. I argue, church, that God measures us on the quality of this theme. God measures us on the quality of our relationships, the quality of our love for one another, the quality of the faith that we show in one another's lives. All of those things is a measure of how successful we are as a church. That's where you say amen. Amen. Yes. But because you didn't say amen, clearly my sermon isn't finished. So let's go to our key text this morning again. One day as he was teaching, from verse 17 in Luke chapter 5, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present. Take note of that, church. God was present there, right? Sure. For him to heal the sick. So some men, other translations say, some friends came in carrying a paralytic, a paralyzed man, on a mat, and they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up onto the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of of Jesus. Amen. I really love this story, church. I think that there are so many gems every single time that I read it. But to give context, as you can see, the room was packed, right? It was full. I don't know if you remember a couple of months ago when we had the young adults combined service here. Hilltop was full, church. It was beautiful. It was full up until the rafters up there. There were people everywhere. There were basically no seats anywhere. It was a beautiful Sunday. I wish we could do that every week. Right? It was full. And Jesus was there. And the Lord was present. The Lord was there for the purpose of people being brought to be taught and to be healed. I think that's what church is for. For people to be taught and to be healed. And these four crazy friends, they're there, they're there with their friend who's lying down paralyzed on a mat. 
doesn't say what happened to him, doesn't say whose fault it was, if it was an accident, if he was born this way, but this man couldn't move. He couldn't come before Jesus by himself. So four friends picked him up and said, that's where Jesus is, we're going there, and we're going to take this friend before Jesus. But it's full, church. It's so busy. There's so many people there gathered, trying to get healing, trying to get teaching from Christ, and we can't get there. So those men, they didn't give up. A lot of us probably would have got, given up. Say, so, you know what, friend, we brought you this far. You can see it's busy today. Jesus, is, his hands are full. You know, maybe let's just stand outside. Maybe Jesus will see us on his way out. Right? But those friends said, you know what? There's a roof. Let's climb the roof. And not, let, let's not only climb the roof, but let's dig through the roof. People are here worshiping. People are having service. I don't know if, if you would, were distracted sometimes when children are running, but would we stay, uh, you know, distracted if, if people were cutting through the roof in the middle of service, right? And then all of a sudden they break through, and then they start lowering somebody down. I'm sure if it was me seeing this, I would have went up to the roof and said, brothers, please let, we're trying to have service, right? That's, that's me in particular. Maybe some of you would have sat down and, and been okay with it. But I probably would have been one of the first brothers to say, come on guys, Jesus is down there, we're having service, can you, can you, can you do this another time? Right? A lot of people would have given up. But these were dedicated friends. Friends with a particular kind of extreme faith. They knew what their paralyzed friend needed, and that was God, and they didn't give up until their friend was at Jesus' feet. Mm -hmm. Friends like these. All right? And let's keep reading. Verse 20, it says, when Jesus saw their faith. It doesn't say Jesus saw the man's faith. It doesn't say Jesus acknowledged that this man asked his friends to bring him to Jesus. It says when Jesus saw their faith, he said what? Friend, your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. Amen. What kind of friends do you have, church? Does God look at your friend's faith and say, because of those people, I'm going to forgive you? I don't know. I don't know if we have those friends. And then the Pharisees, of course, people are going to complain. They're going to say, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But I love Jesus. He, I love when he flexes like this. He knew what they were thinking and said, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? They didn't even say them out loud. But Jesus here, he says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has this authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Amen. 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 These friends led their paralyzed friend to Jesus, a sick body but also a soul that needed to be in front of Christ. So this morning, church, what I'm here to say is that we need friends, we need a church family that does whatever it takes to lower us down before Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Especially when life has paralyzed us. So how do we go about lowering one another down? How do we do so? The very first thing that we have to do in order to lower one another down is you have to know your friend. You have to know one another. These friends didn't pick up a stranger on the street. These friends weren't just doing a random good deed. They knew that their friend was paralyzed and needed healing. Who knows you, church? Who do you know? How many people here do you know deeply? Do they know your struggles? Do they know your pain? 
name? Do they know the goodness in your life? Do they know, do they know you at all? It's very easy for us to come here and greet and hug and keep it moving. It's two and a half hours every week, we barely interact, and we can get by without knowing anybody. But I think that's a disservice to the family that God put together. Because we are a family church. Yes. I'm blessed that in this church, in this building right now, that there's a few brothers that I can say know me, know me deeply. There's a few brothers that I can say know my challenges, know my struggles, know what I'm going through on a regular basis. There's a few brothers who will not let a week pass without calling me or messaging me. That's a tremendous blessing, right? And I hope that I give them the same love that they share with me. That's the purpose of why we're here. That's the, the purpose and the extent of our membership is friendship. It has to be beyond greetings and hugs, right? Beyond Fellowship Sunday where we eat, you know, some good food for a little bit. What does the Bible say? Proverbs 18, 24 says, Some friends pretend to be friends. Amen? I know some of you know that one, right? Some of you have felt that. They pretend to be friends, but a true friend sticks closer than a brother sticks closer than a sister. Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, A friend shows his friendship at all times. It is for adversity that such a brother is born. That's powerful, right? That friends are not just friends for good times, but friends, the purpose of them is for adversity. That's why we have one another, right? The purpose of our bonds is for adversity. It's for us to be present at each other's sides when things are difficult. And I think that in order for us to be a church that's modeled off of these four friends found in Luke, we have to know one another. And it's also important to say that knowing one another is very different than knowing one another's business, all right? Um, we're very quick to know the dabas of one another, all right? What's happening in people's lives, what they might be dealing with, the stories we hear. But there's a difference in knowing one another's business and being invested in one another's well-being and one another's lives, all right? So church, let's know one another. The second thing that we have to do in order to lower one another down before Christ is we have to take action, just like these four friends, right? Now, if you think about houses in this time, in Capernaum and other parts of the ancient world, they had specific kinds of roof. Because of insulation, because of the heat, they had a roof that was made out of a lot of tree saplings, like a lot of small trees. And then in those tree saplings, they would take these big briar bushes and put those into the spaces in between the trees. And then they would add mud on top of all of those bushes and saplings and wait for it to dry. And then on top of that, they would add tile, right? So it wasn't a simple roof that you could just dig into, right? These friends had to not only climb this roof, but then they had to remove tiles, they had to cut through mud, they had to remove brush and cut through trees. This wasn't a simple process. When I, when I first remembered the story, I was thinking, no, you know what, they just went up to the, the roof and it was easy, they tore open this roof and then they lowered their front down. That wasn't it. There was action required over and over to go through this process. And Brother Chris, I'm sure that when they left home, they didn't bring rope with them, right? They didn't go there with a the plan to say, we're going to go there and cut through a roof and then, 
and, and then lower somebody down. They had to get supplies. So as they were going through this plan, somebody had to say, get a knife, get a saw, let's keep going. Right? I'm sure one of the four friends was like, hey, this is a lot of work. Somebody had to keep encouraging them and say, no, let's keep going. we got to keep do doing this. Send somebody else to go get some rope. Right? Because we don't have rope to lower this brother down. In order for us to lower someone down before Christ Church, we have to take continued action. It's not one step. It's a continuous process. Right? Replicating this faith requires action. You have to know somebody and you have to lift them up. I don't know if you've ever tried to lift up another full-size human being, right? Humans, especially when they're sick or when their bodies are weak, they're heavy, right? It's a hard process. It's not easy. You don't just throw somebody over your back, especially a grown man. Sometimes your friend's situation is so heavy that you have to go get three more friends to help you lift them up, church. Are you with me? And then you're not done. You have to go and climb the roof. And you have to dig through that roof. A lot of friends, when they got there, would have said, you know what, friend? You've been paralyzed for a really long time. I'm, I'm tired of carrying you around. We, every week we have to carry you. Every Sunday, we have to carry you to church. I'm tired. You know? Can't you do something by yourself? Well, you know what? We're going to leave you at home today. We're going to go to see Jesus. We're going to church. And we'll see you later. All right? But that's not what these friends did. They took action. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says, finally, all of you being like-minded, being sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Sometimes, church, sympathy alone is not enough. Prayer alone is not enough. Love alone is not enough. Compassion alone is not enough. James 2.26, you all know this verse, it says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds, faith without works, faith without action is also dead. It's great for us to have love, to have sympathy, to pray, to have compassion, but sometimes, church, we have to act. Sometimes people's circumstances are so dire, they're so paralyzed, that we can't just say, you know what, brother, I'll pray for you. Brother, I'll love you from over here. My sister, you know what? I've got compassion for your situation. Sometimes we have to take action. Amen. My third point is in order to truly spur one another on to greater levels of love, just like our theme says, we actually have to actively take people to where Jesus is. All right? I want us to go to the story of Job and the book of Job for a moment and give some comparison against these four friends in Luke. Job chapter 2. Now we all know the story of Job. He's a man that was being tested by God and Satan who had literally everything taken away from him. His health, his family, his money, his well-being, his home, his, his livestock, everything. And this is what happened when Job's three close friends came to see him. Chapter 2, verse 11, it says, When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement, so they planned together to do what? To go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. This wasn't the same friend. They began to weep aloud. 
and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat down with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Seven days is a long time, church. I don't know if I called a friend and they saw that everything in my life had fallen apart, that like, I'm hurting, life is falling apart, and you just want to come and sit with me for seven days in silence. Would that, would that make you feel good? I know the man was hurting, I know they didn't have words to say, but Brother Amos, seven days is a long time to not say a word, right? For my three closest friends. But then, these guys actually started talking. Because they can't understand why Job is suffering so much. So what do they do? They jump to conclusions about why. So the first friend, let's go to chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. Eliphaz. He says, Job, you're a source of strength to so many people. But consider this. Who, being innocent, has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed in all his, his knowledge, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. So come on, Job. When have you ever seen someone innocent struggle? When have you seen someone upright get destroyed? Fear. 16, I love this. He says, you will surely forget your trouble. Bruh. My family is dead. My house is falling apart. What are you talking about? How am I going to forget this? We're calling it only as waters gone by. Life will be brighter than the noonday, and darkness will become like morning. Now, some of you might be questioning Job's friends here, but if you go back and read chapter 2, verse 9, Job's own wife says, why are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. By a show of hands, how many of us would want friends like this when we're struggling? When we're going through things? Probably nobody, right? Friends that sit in silence for days on end. Friends that just blame us. What kind of people do you have in your life? What kind of people do you have here at church? Are these people that are only around when things are good or when things are bad? And what kind of advice do they give you? Which direction do they point you? Are they like Job's friends, Job's wife? Or are they like these friends in Luke? One of the worst things that we can do in times of difficulty is go to the wrong people for advice and wisdom. All right? As many people, despite even their love for you or their intentions, will not direct you on a path that sends you towards Christ. I don't know if you heard me, church. Many people despite how much they love you, despite how well-intentioned they are, their advice, their wisdom, will not be something that sends you closer to Christ. The right friends, the right members of the church will run to you and say, you know what, I got you. I see what you're going through, and you know what, I know where to take you. I'm not gonna tell you about my situation, my experience, I'm going to take you where? To Christ. Whatever I do for you, the first thing that I'm going to do is put you at Christ's feet. That's why we're here. We're not here just to sing songs. We're not here just to gather for two and a half hours every Sunday and say, you'll talk Church of Christ and be proud of that. We are here to show care and love. We're here for healing, for love, for redemption. 
That's the purpose of the church. My last point, church, and I love this part of the scripture. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven. And everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. Amen. Amen. When Jesus saw the faith of these friends, he took his own action. He healed. He forgave. And everyone that was there praised God. All right? Everyone. That's what the scripture says. It doesn't say some people in the house. It says everyone. There were Pharisees and Sadducees there that a few moments ago were questioning. It says everyone praised God. Let's read it because some of you might not believe me. It says from verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they began thinking to themselves, you knew what they were thinking. Verse 23, friends, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up and walk. But as you may know, the Son of Man is authorized on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. I think that God, when he sees Hilltop, he wants us to do remarkable things. He wants us to lead acts of faith that lead to people's amazement. He wants people to praise him because of the work that we do here. We have to pray for courage and strength and persistence in reaching out to those people whose only salvation is by us picking them up and bringing them to God. There's a lot of people, church, here and outside that are waiting for us on their mat to pick them up. To not walk past them, but to lift them up. And when we bring people who cannot come here on their own, who cannot become, come in front of Christ's healing on their own, who don't have that strength, when we do that, they jump up healed. They jump up saved. And everybody around us praises God. That's an amazing thing. When we motivate one another to good works, those acts of faith will affect other people. Not only us, but everyone else that we come in contact with. A lot of people are going to glorify God. Some people, like the Pharisees, will scoff, but our faith will always make a difference in this world. I want us to look left and right. Look behind you, in front of you, and say, Friend, lower me down. Friend, lower me down. Some of you are saying more things than I told you to. But friend, lower me down. Our, our primary responsibility, church, is to, you're still lowering one another down, amen. <laughs> our primary responsibility as a church is to take care of one another. Amen. That's why we're here. I asked you at the beginning, why are we here? We're here to take care of one another. It's that simple. We don't always have to get along. I'm not saying that we must be best of friends, we must all be trophies. I'm not saying that we must always agree about everything. You know, Brother Chris, I love Brother Chris to death. I really do. And there's a lot of things that me and Brother Chris do not agree on. But you know what I trust? I trust Brother Chris's love for me. All right? And that's it. We have to take care of one another. That's it. Whether we agree or disagree, whether or not we hang out on a Saturday and have a bride, we must show love one another at all times with faith always 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 showing love and putting one another first what's the power of friendship church the 
power of friendship is that friends rejoice in one another. Friends work for the good of their friendships. Friends celebrate, they advocate, they defend. Friends are encouragers. Friends sorrow with our sorrows. Friends celebrate with our joy. Friendship, I read this quote, it says, Friendship is an embodiment of the goodness and steadfast love of God. Right? When we show friendship, we're showing God's characteristics. And I think that's the kind of congregation that Hilltop should focus on being. Why? Because some of us are tired. Some of us are paralyzed. I don't know if you're feeling paralyzed today. If you're sick, if it's your job, if it's your marriage, if it's your finances, if it's your health, if it's your family, if it's your children, sometimes, sometimes our problems in life are like literally so much that we can't move. I don't know if I'm speaking to anybody. But sometimes we are so paralyzed that you literally have no clue what to do, church. You can be so paralyzed where you're like, I have no answer. I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation or all these situations. Life is literally showing me flames. Right? You have no idea where to start. And you certainly can't get to a place of healing by yourself. But you know what? If that's how you feel today, church, it's okay. Because guess what? You're in the right place. You just looked to your neighbor and said, friend, lower me down. Friend, I'm going to lower you down. If, that's, if you're paralyzed, if you can't move, you are in the right place, church. This is where you're supposed to be. This is where you're supposed to be when you don't have any answers. This is what you're supposed to be when you can't move by yourself. When you have no idea what to do and where to go and where to turn. You are in the right place. Look, talk Church of Christ. God's church is the right place for you, church. What does our theme say? It says, somebody please, when I'm in that place of being paralyzed, show me greater levels of love that I'm not used to, that I haven't seen before, that no one has extended to me. Someone motivate me. Someone grab me and lower me down at Jesus' feet. He'll talk, when we lower one another down, it's a reflection of our faith. It's a reflection of our love. It's a reflection of our stewardship. It's a reflection of our own obedience to God. When we lower one another down at Christ's feet, that's what God is calling us to. Amen. Amen.